All right, everybody. Um, yeah, I feel like there are still people coming in, but um, in having having an eye on the time, I think we we should get started with today's webinar. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining our webinar. Um, my name is Tim Norton. Um, I am the coordinator of the Water Governance Group um, of the Water Use Network. Um, and yeah, I'm going to do my best to host this webinar um, on the role of youth in water and peace. Um, first of all, yeah, we would like to get you or like each of our participants a little bit better. Um, so um, yeah, maybe put in your name and like maybe the region or your professional background um, into the chat so everybody can see it. And while you're doing this, I'm going to give a very brief introduction on the Water Youth Network. Um, yeah, the Water Youth Network itself um, is an attempt to connect students, young water professionals um, in the water sector and therefore provide opportunities to get involved in several projects and water topics across disciplines. Um, yeah, thereby we really focus on young um, people and yeah, try to empower them uh, and to develop skills and expertise and yeah, to create and advance water sector solutions, especially with a look on the SDGs. Um, in this case, we most recently became um, the focal point within the um, United Nations major group for ch children and youth on SDG 6. And yeah, we are very, very key on working on this. And hence, yeah, this webinar is an effort to create awareness on SDG 6, especially with potential interlinkages with SDG 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions. Um, and yeah, therefore, we really enjoy, everybody enjoys this. Uh, we really hope everybody enjoys this webinar. Um, I'm going to give a brief outline. Um, first of all, our first speaker will be um, the United Nations Envoy on Youth, um, Mrs. Jatma Vikramanaike. Um, and afterwards, we're going to have a short Q&A session on yeah, whatever um, everybody wants to know from her and like yeah, what, what she spoke about. Afterwards, we have um, Boda Sharipova representing the Blue, Blue Peace Movement and the World Youth Parliament for Water. Um, yeah, we're going to have a short Q&A session afterwards as well. And um, yeah, last but not least, um, Natalia Bochno from the Water Youth Network is going to present on our um, involvements in projects and so on. And yeah, if there's time left at the end, we're going to open the floor again for more questions. Um, furthermore, yeah, please keep everybody's microphone muted during the presentation. If you have questions already, um, please indicate this in the chat so yeah, we know afterwards whom to pick and then you can directly ask the questions um, to our presenters. And yeah, now I think with further, yeah, without further ado, let's jump into the webinar and start with our first um, speaker. We're very grateful um, she made it today. Um, yeah, let's give the floor to um, the United Nations Envoy on Youth. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, and also colleagues for, for the invitation. As I said, very happy to be here and, and speak to um, all of you a little bit about what I have been doing and what the UN has been doing on the stages, but particularly, as Tim said, with a focus on Goal 16, peace and security, young people's involvement in peace building. Um, and the second objective for me is really to learn from you of what you are doing in terms of um, bridging these two together, Goal 6 and 16, um, and the amazing initiatives that you are already conducting on the ground on water and, and and seeing the collaborations with these two and, and see how we can work together but particularly in the uh, lead up to the Secretary General's Climate Summit this September. Um, we want to uh, learn a lot about young people and their involvement in these issues to possibly also showcase those um, solutions at the climate summit that the Secretary General will be convening. So I'm, I'm very open to listen to your ideas, recommendations and, and feedback as well. Um, but to start with, um, when um, when the agenda was shared with me, I was um, asked to talk a little bit about youth peace and security. Um, I think all of us know that um, this has been such a 
uh, groundbreaking um, topic that inside the United Nations in the last five years since the adoption of the Security Council 2250, the resolution 2250 on youth peace and security. Uh, there is certainly a big shift of the narrative of seeing young people not only as perpetrators of violence or victims of violence or as troublemakers, but really seeing them as the true peace builders they are, especially based on values and, and guiding principles like equality where young people are treated as equal partners, not as passive beneficiaries, um, being gender responsive and gender, sens gender sensitive, um, and also with principles such as um, doing no harm. So the five um, pillars that were recognized by the Security Council on youth peace and security, participation, protection, prevention, disintegration and reintegration um, and partnerships are really the guiding framework for all of us to go um, beyond the UN headquarters in New York and beyond the Security Council and really take this to a country level. Since the adoption of the resolution, we have a few countries who have expressed their interest in sort of developing national action plans to improve implement 2250 resolution countries from the north like uh, global north like finland and countries from the global south like colombia has made commitments on this regard um, but also we see um, a very good trend of integrating the recommendations of youth peace and security into existing peace and security plans to women's peace, women peace and security plans um, in a number of member states. Um, and what really geared up this process is the progress study, the independent progress study that was done um, by uh, an independent author on behalf of the Secretary General um, and uh, advised by an advisor advisory board of intergenerational advisory board of young people and um, other experts um, really giving very concrete recommendations as to what the United Nations can do to advance young people's role in peace building and then as to what the member states can do uh, to make sure that young people's potential is fully realized uh, for all all steps of a peace uh, and conflict cycle. Um, and upon the presentation of the progress studies to the Security Council, and if you haven't read it, I would really recommend um, reading the progress study because it is a fascinating read that summarizes um, the I wouldn't really say just that recommendations, but like dreams and hopes and aspirations of about 4,000 young people who were consulted by the UN um, to produce this report to the Security Council. And it is also the first report of such kind that was presented to the Security Council because usually the Secretary General or people at the UN writes these reports without making it very consultative, but this was um, one of the, um, I would say we set a benchmark by doing this progress study in such a consultative manner. And once it was presented to the Security Council, uh, we got another mandate to include um, youth in peace negotiations and peace mediation efforts. And that really goes into the second part of my brief presentation here, where, um, um, it was mentioned that you would like me to talk about this global policy paper that we developed on um, on youth participation in mediation and peace processes. So um, first week of March in um, Helsinki, Finland, um, we gathered about um, 40 young peace builders, but also practitioners, activists, uh, governments, uh, civil society and other stakeholders um, for a global symposium to really go into priority area number one of 20 to 50 participation, but particularly participation of peace processes to really dive deep and analyze how young people contribute to peace negotiations, mediations and negotiation of peace agreements. And we found that um, it is not uniform across the world and across countries, across contexts, it's very different. But um, the other finding was that young people are extremely creative and innovative in the ways that they participate in peace negotiations. And this doesn't necessarily mean like sitting in a room where the peace agreement is negotiated, but this can look um, in different forms. So we 
took an approach called um, an onion onion approach where you have like different layers so we uh, we identified three layers the first one was inside the room how young people contribute to peace negotiations sometimes this is as parts of um, national delegations na- government delegations but sometimes also young people participate as uh, rebel leaders or leaders of armed groups um, and sometimes young people participate as technical experts to these uh, peace negotiations in cases like um, DRC uh, and South Sudan uh, the youth had a separate seat to participate so through youth council and youth movements young people have been in rooms either as delegates as negotiators mediators or um, sometimes even passive ob- service and uh, the second layer was what youth do around the room so beyond the uh, peace negotiations there are sometimes like different technical committees set up to discuss gender issues youth issues um, and sometimes social issues political issues economic issues and we found that um, young people also participate in these committees and rooms um, around the main negotiations providing the research the technical support uh, but but also providing thematic expertise on different um, aspects of a peace agreement um, and sometimes they also uh, take part in monitoring ceasefire agreements implementation of peace agreements um, and um, in certain peace uh, negotiations there had been formal consultations with different groups in society and there had been particular consultations focusing young people so this is how they participate around the room and then the third layer was outside the room so for an example what we saw in colombia the peace camp the peace marches uh, the mass mobilizations of young people in south sudan um, the the we are watching new campaign where young people used social media to influence um, a positive outcome for the peace agreement um, and um, really the marches the campaigns and how young people put pressure on the out- outside for parties to come to a peaceful agreement and what we found out was it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be closer to the center or closer to the peace and table to be influential sometimes you can be an observer within the room but have no power at all because you could just be an observer but what you do a, through a peace march or a protest or a campaign outside uh, the peace negotiations have proven to be more powerful than the influence that you can have as a passive observer in in a peace negotiation table so um the the impact is very different uh, and the um um the ways of intervening is very different in these different contexts and also they're not mutually exclusive of each other because what we um, again found was the solidarity between different groups of young people that works across these borders like how young people who are in the room is coordinating with those who are marching outside the room to make sure that all their priorities are aligned together for an example in the philippines this was one of the um, very good case studies of of that uh, uh, coordination across different sectors or also different layers um and this uh, includes uh, really going into some of the specific case studies of certain countries where young people played a, a big role in um, negotiating peace agreements but it also spoke a lot about uh, or, or found out a lot about the lack of data and research that has been there on this particular topic like if you compare it for an example to the gender agenda you can um women's agenda you can find some very concrete research and also numbers for an example 2% of all mediators are women or 5% of all signatories to peace agreements are women but even though young people have traditionally played roles like young women included in peace agreements and peace negotiations they have gone undocumented um so there is also a need to do specific research in depth about collecting this data visualizing it um and really help us make the case uh, for for more inclusive and meaningful you think engagement um so i have a lot to say but i'm just going to limit that because i know we are we are short of time but i just thought because um more because you are working um a lot on water related issues uh, some uh, ex- experiences that i had in my 
travels to different parts of the world. For an example, when I was in Uzbekistan, the water related issues were very much in the priority of young people there. And they spoke about how sort of this hydro diplomacy can be used as a way to bridge conflicts between countries but also make sure that everyone has like equal access to water um, and then for an example in the lake chad basin like nigeria niger cameroon how like water scarcity is specifically due to climate change effects is um, affecting different like tribal groups to fight therefore being a, a cause for a uh, conflict there and how young women and girls now have to walk for miles and miles under very like treacherous circumstances circumstances to find water, therefore uh, putting them at risk of uh, being in violence. Um, and um, also I've heard like many stories, for an example, when I was in Bangladesh about uh, water and sanitation, again, particularly with, um, with the gender focus. But again, I'm not as, as expert on that topic. So I'm really interested in knowing from all of you how you uh, tackle these issues in your communities and your areas of work. But very quickly, just to also make sure that the interlinkage between this and the SDG agenda is there. Um, the SDG 6 is obviously a very important goal. And uh, I think 5.2, the target is about uh, making sure there's water cooperation across uh, boundaries. And I think that is also a really good entry point, I think, to bridge these two agendas on youth participation in work related to development, particularly on water and sanitation, but on uh, peace building as well. Um, yeah, so that's it from my side. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah. Thank you very much um, for those for those insights. Um, yeah, I, I really really uh, liked um, everything that you said before, especially like the anecdotes of the different case studies and countries. Um, so yeah, yeah. Now we would really like to open the stage for questions um, from the audience. Um, if anybody just yeah has a question, just indicate it real briefly in the chat, um, and then we will um, yeah select the persons and um, yeah have them ask their questions if there are any um, already um, let me check real quick if we have something so far so far we have only a lot of, of very interesting backgrounds and a very very global audience um, I really really like it um, so yeah maybe we just go ahead and um, ask ask one of one of our questions um, that are that are burning um, Maybe, if sorry. I can interrupt you. I can actually stay through till the end. So if you want to take questions at the end, then I will also be available to answer. All right. Yeah, I think that's that's even better because, like, yeah, the more the more questions we're getting from the actual audience, the better it is. Um, okay. Then I think we're just going to do it like this, and yeah, for now on, continue with the presentations. Um, and uh, yeah, therefore, uh, thank you very much again. And then I'm very happy to announce. Um, yeah, Boda Sharipova from the World uh, Youth Parliament for Water um, and the Blue Peace Initiative, yeah, who is going to give us more insights and I think especially um, maybe concerning Central Asia and Uzbekistan, as already mentioned. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Boda Sharipova. Um, I'm from Kazakhstan, from Central Asia. And uh, today here I am representing World Youth Parliament for Water. Currently I'm studying on Water Cooperation and Diplomacy Mastery Program at Aichi Institute for Water Education. And um, so I am going to uh, <clears throat> touch about, uh, upon three main topics. It's about Blue Peace Movement. Uh, then I'll speak about case of my region, about youth mobilization in Central Asia for water. And third is to introduce youth for water and peace platform. So why uh, water related conflicts and um, problems are so much important now? If we look through the human history, we'll see that um, problems related uh, other resources and land, the, um, they, um, compared to them, water related problems, they are relatively new. And that's why um, role of youth nowadays should be reinforced. Uh, because um, uh, solutions for other problems, they are not working anymore for water, and that's why the uh, role of the youth is so much important. Uh, I would uh, ask, 
why uh, youth are so powerful now. That is because we are young, we have an energy, we have knowledge, uh, we are not belonging to any organization. And we have this amazing network and we have all the means to communicate with each other and we are not pursuing any interests. And when we come to water-related issues and role of youth, it is not only about decision-making or policy-making, it is also about uh, other issues like um, uh, pollution of oceans with the, uh, with the plastic, about glacier smell because of climate change, uh, it is about um, poor sanitation, it is about access to clean water. And all of these actions, they, um, all of these problems, they require immediate actions. Um, I would uh, speak a bit about transboundary river basins. As you probably know, the transboundary rivers, which are shared between two or more countries, they cover 42% of Earth's surface and uh, with a population of um, almost 50%. And we can understand that it is uh, so difficult to share this water, knowing that it is becoming less and less, that water quality is so important and knowing about water scarcity in future. And that's why here I would like to introduce Blue Peace Movement, which started in Switzerland in 2017 and is now spread over the world. Uh, so Blue Peace is, um, is, uh, <clears throat> is as it hard, is about um, transforming water um, from potential source of conflict and crisis into potential source of peace and cooperation and security. It is about uh, delivering this message to another people that uh, water can be used as an entry point for cooperation in, all, in other sectors as well. And also it is about um, informing another people that water is a scarce resource and it will not be all, always there, unlimited and with good quality. For me personally, Blue Peace is a lens through which I look uh, into water issues. Uh, what, what, can, what can we all uh, gain from when we share water. Um, and it is also about building trust, about um, uh, being transpar transparent with, uh, in your relation with other people, even if they are from, from other countries. Uh, <clears throat> also, I would like to share with you a story from Central, Central Asia, which was uh, slightly mentioned as Uzbekistan. Here on the map, you can see all the stan countries, who are Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Afghanistan. Uh, so it's difficult to remember, but I'll try to, to tell you briefly what is the problems. So here we have two major transboundary rivers. It's Amudarya and Sirdarya. And I also, um, so Central Asia is usually associated with the, with the biggest handmade environmental disaster, is desiccation of the Aral Sea, which used to be fourth biggest sea in the world. But as you can see on these maps, in the, during the um, period of less than 40 years, it lost 90% of its surface area. And um, it, was, it happened because of the, the inten, uh, in, intensified agriculture and water withdrawal for that. And here you can see picture from the, from the previous, previously it was bottom of the Aral Sea and now it is just Aral Kum Desert and Museum of the Old Ships. Uh, and what are the problems now? The thing is that upstream countries, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and Afghanistan, as you can see with the blue column here, they generate a lot of water, but they do not abstract um, them a lot. While downstream countries, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan, uh, they are abstracting water, but they are not generating that much of it. And uh, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Afghanistan, which are upstreamers, they want to develop their hydropower capacity, and that would probably uh, negatively affect agriculture of the downstream countries. So that's why uh, we have these uh, problems with the hydro diplomacy and these things on, on political level, mostly how to, about water allocation. So what use in Central Asia can do? Uh, on this picture, you can also see me hiding behind the plants. <laughs> Before uh, June 2017, I was really thinking that you cannot do anything because everything should be done on political, very high level. Because water is so much securitized and politicized in Central Asia. 
But in 2017, I was participating in a youth workshop organized by International Secretariat for Water with the support of SDC, where uh, young people, so we were, there were 25 of us uh, during four days. Um, so we we're all from six countries, six STEM countries, and we were working on drafting youth uh, vision for water in Central Asia. And we all agreed on the text after five uh, days and sleepless nights. <laughs> so it starts with our imagination of future. We, the youth of Central Asia, want to live in a world where water has no borders and where young people can speak and participate in decision-making processes regarding water-related issues. We want to serve with appropriate conditions and respect for everyone, from individuals of community to well-trained professionals within a framework of trust and transparency. We are convinced that water issues can be solved in such a world. And then after that, we agreed on four uh, main topics where, as we think, youth can, can contribute, can do something. So this is transboundary cooperation, education and capacity building, technology, and water sanitation and hygiene. And there we formulated vision in a way that we are showing uh, what we can do as youth and then what kind of support do we need. So this is how the vision looks like, and it, it is in open access in the internet, if you want to have a look. So we had an opportunity to deliver um, our uh, main, uh, main provision of our vision, and also key messages from use at different platforms, uh, high-level um, international platforms, and also on regional level. So our key, key messages were that uh, enough funds and support should be allocated for youth education in the water sector. And also then you, that youth is um, ready to contribute to dialogue on transboundary rivers on, on lowest level and also to participate in decision-making process. And that youth networking and close interaction of youth with other stakeholders should be encouraged. But also at the same time, we realized that uh, only speaking, uh, speaking is also nice on high level panels and participate in, in the events, but also we know that it is very important to do something um, on the ground as well. And so uh, I would like to tell you about two events, which and two projects we are conducting right now as a Central Asian chapter of the World Youth Parliament for Water. So we organized Blue Base Day at University for Peace. It is located in Costa Rica, and there we have students from all over the world. So we organized um, a sh um, short workshop on Blue Peace to deliver a message: what is what is Blue Peace and why um, why water should be uh, should be included into into peace agenda over the world? Why water water related issues are becoming more and more important? And also we had some interactive sessions there. And it was so um, such an important event and so many people, uh, young people, students from our peace-related uh, studies, they reached out and they were asking a lot of questions. They were uh, really willing and they actually joined our uh, movement for water. Uh, also, our second initiative is about youth inclusion into Basin Council. We just started, we wanted to try it and we did it in Kazakhstan in 2017. It worked so well that we now want to um, do it in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. In Kyrgyzstan, we already get the official permission from the ministry, from the Department of Water Resources. So by that, what we, can, what we are aiming to do, first is that we are trying to ensure youth uh, to bring innovative solutions of young people into decision-making process regarding the basins regarding the basin there they are studying and living and also to ensure the um, um, interaction in the um, interlinkage between science and practice so that young people can can get feedbacks on their research so that they can develop their networks and uh, maybe there would be some f opportunities for future inter internship or employment so that's, um, these are two projects I, I want to tell you about. So we were lucky to, to get support from international development partners after they saw uh, activities which we are doing now where uh, youth-related projects are supported in Central Asia by SDC and World Bank. And we have um, quite a lot of uh, activities related to capacity building and uh, youth mobilization and summer school. 
and different events and uh, obviously also use participation in basing councils. Um, so, and third, uh, so last but not least, I want to tell you about, um, about Youth for Water and Peace platform. It is, uh, it is a product of cooperation between World Youth Parliament for Water, Geneva Water Hub, and the International Secretariat for Water. Uh, so this is a platform for young people. This is a space to, for young people to share their ideas, their vision, their views about, uh, about water and peace. And also to get to know each other and to, to, to actually share ideas and discuss everything what is happening in different parts of the world. So that's basically it what I wanted to share with you and here you can see my uh, contacts and also the web page of the parliament also some YouTube video about our Blue Peace Day at UPS and also presentation. Um, present, we will upload presentation here and um, you can contact me anytime you have any question and also ask here. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, um, Boda, on those um, insights, especially, yeah, on opportunities to get involved, as well as, yeah, the case study on um, Central Asia. Um, yeah, for now on, I think we're going to hear a little bit more on, yeah, water cooperation or, like, potentials um, to do something within water, and therefore, I would really like to invite Natalia um, for her presentation. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you, and it's great to see so much um, interest in the topic. So I'm just going to take a second to share. Great. Can everyone see my presentation? Thumbs up? Great. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on the Water Youth Network, we've been around since 2012 and we've been working on creating a space for young people to connect to one another, but also to engage with decision makers at the high level. Um, to give you a bit of background on the context that has been created for us generously by the UN, um, the UN Security Resolution 2250, the Water Youth Network focuses on participation on prevention and on partnership. So I'll speak a little bit more about how our work ties into these uh, three of the five pillars. Um, but just to give you a quick uh, look, it's about including uh, young people at all levels, uh, not just at the high level as Boda uh, suggested. Uh, prevention, um, looking at how integrated water resource management can help reduce the risks of conflict tied to uh, water security and partnership um, across sectors and across generations. So we're familiar with what the challenge is. And the research in the field when it comes to water security is very adamant about the need to have strong and resilient institutions that can meet the challenges faced by climate change uh, and uncertainties. Um, it's the uncertainty that causes the um, potential of conflict. And so it's very important that young people are also connected to institutions, especially given that we're currently living in a very young world. Um, about 40% of people today are younger than 25. So young people, um, we, we are the future and the future is now. And so it's very important to uh, give youth the space at decision making tables. So, so what does it mean for the water sector? Um, Part of our research is looking at could cooperation for improved water management temper against climate induced migration, livelihood risks, um, trying to understand what are um, the trigger points for youth. So our guiding principles are to look at IWM, so that's Integrated Water Resource Management for folks that are joining the call that don't have the water background. And um, to uh, also look at how young people can participate in track one and track two and track three diplomacy, um, which was uh, very well presented using that onion approach. I really love that. Um, and really centering uh, young people as a key actor, but also acknowledging that youth are a very diverse group. Oh, pardon. So in... Um, Researching the role of young people, we've generously uh, been provided support by IHE Delft in the Netherlands in the DUPC project. P part of the first phase, which uh, actually answers one of the questions that was in the chat, is 
we used a global survey. We reached uh, over 100 practitioners that work specifically in the field of water and in youth engagement. Um, over 45 uh, countries were represented in the survey. I'll show you a slide about that in a sec. Uh, and using the survey, we're working to construct a workshop for youth uh, engaged in water diplomacy in June. Um, prior to this, we'd also like to host more engagement similar to this to really allow uh, as many people as possible to engage on this topic. And the outcome is going to be a recommendations paper on what could be done to overcome the barriers the young peace fielders uh, face. So just to give you a sense of who was participating in the survey, we had a very significant representation from Africa and the Middle East. Um, unfortunately, we also received a lot of feedback from participants that there was not enough support from governments in terms of offices that were specifically set up to acknowledge young people, um, to develop a youth policy, to formalize the participation of youth, or to offer uh, support so young people can organize themselves. Now, through the initial desk research and from what we found in the survey, we developed four roles, um, which we're looking to expand upon. But in essence, uh, young people can fall into one of these four categories, which is as a disruptor, protesting and advocating um, decisions that are made, amplifying messages. So this could be uh, sharing online, but um, also gossip and rumors um, could be a positive or a, a negative when it comes to escalating conflict. Provider, uh, this one means taking an entrepreneurial approach to both opportunities and threats. It could be someone starting their own wash business, um, organizing their community to plant trees, but it could also be someone who requires funding and their livelihood is at risk and they're being recruited uh, by an armed group. Connector is relationship building. Um, it is seeking to build cooperation through building trust. Uh, so as I acknowledged, um, there's already quite a few young people and it's, it's time that we really start thinking about how to uh, include us. I say us, given that I'm already uh, at the early stage of my 30s and the idea of youth in the international sector can go up until the age of 35. Um, so a bit of flux there. Uh, so young people as a provider, so uh, what I mentioned before, there's different roles that this can take, uh, positive or negative. Um, really looking forward to having a bit more discussion at the end of this call to get your feedback on what this means. Um, there's several reports, including from the Lake Chad Basin, to look into the role uh, of young people in preventing violent conflict that we've drawn upon. Um, and as we're already starting to see, young people are engaging online and through social media. There was another question about how we're tracking this. Um, so we're open to feedback from you about other campaigns that you know where young people have been engaged in water diplomacy. This is a fairly emerging field um, and there's quite a lot of work to do to link the role um, the youth are playing in water uh, to diplomacy um, and to building more resilient institutions. Uh, and because we're such a large, substantial group, um, there, there's quite a bit of documenting that still needs to happen. And we don't always engage at the same levels. Um, as was mentioned, we can be formally engaged from the top down through funding and government initiatives, but also through grassroots movements. So young people are a connector. Uh, here's an example of the Blue Passport, and there's quite a lot of terrific work that BOTA also just uh, showcased through the World Youth Parliament for Water. Um, in the Blue Peace Initiative. So one attempt that the Water Youth Network is doing to collect data, but also to create a platform for young people to put their ideas forward, even if they don't have an existing initiative, is to organize a virtual challenge. So think of it as a, a hackathon or, or something along those lines. We will be focused on three ideas. One is transboundary cooperation, but also DRR, so disaster risk reduction, and climate change adaptation. Um, this will be open to youth under the age of 35. So in the months to come, um, we'll be launching this and I will be adding a little form uh, in the dialogue box once I'm done with the presentation so that you can stay tuned and uh, participate with this, but also in roundtables to come. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say the young people can be identified as a threat to peace or an opportunity to prevent conflict. 
Um, and it really depends on what type of spaces we create for young people to engage um, and how our perception, perception ends up essentially framing the opportunity for young people to be true peace builders. So feel free to connect with us um, online through Twitter at Water YouthNet. Um, our website's below and I'm going to be including a link to that form. And just some questions to get us thinking as we um, lead into the discussion. It would be great to hear from you on what you think youth-led peace building could look like, um, what obstacles you face, and why you think it's important for young people to be part of the solution. Thank you. And just to share the form. All right. Um, yeah. You Thank you very much, Natalia. Um, as well, yeah. Please um, check out the link in the chat box. Um, yeah, to to get further more involved and yeah, to gather gather a little bit of more insight um, of what everybody interested. And yeah, thanks a lot as well to directly introducing the um, Q and A. Um, I've just quickly che checked the chat. Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of questions um, came in already. Um, and yeah, we would really like to give everybody from the participants um, the stage to ask their own questions. Um, so I would just like quickly uh, read out the names and then yeah, feel free to um, unmute yourself and ask the questions to um, our speakers today. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to um, start with Anna, um, who has a question on yeah, the visual representation of the youth influencing water debates. So, by the requirements. Uh, hello, Anna. Do you want to ask your question? Yes, well, I was just I just want to class after the speaker to talk in the Okay, apparently, um, we have a couple of uh, technical uh, difficulties. Um, maybe I just then uh, read it out uh, for everybody um, yeah, to, to have um, a little bit of public participation the other way then. Um, Anna's question is more or less, um, if I'm just going to read it out, um, in this case, um, I wondered how do you plan to make the visual representation of the use influencing water debates? Uh, and do you carry out surveys or can you follow trends on social media? Um, and I feel like, yeah, uh, Natalia already gave a very good example um, how we conduct um, surveys and studies. Um, maybe Bota, do you have anything um, yeah, similar to share on this case? Because I think you, you conducted a study as well quite recently. Uh, yes, actually, we conducted uh, also a survey. It was both online and also during the high-level conference on um, water decade, water for sustainable development. It was in Tajikistan last year in June 2018. And we also conducted a survey to learn about what are the problems young people from Central Asia working in the water sector are facing. So that's quite a similar approach. And also we have Facebook pages. There we sometimes we have this quick and short surveys. Yeah, so that would be uh, what we do as Central Asian chapter and for the uh, entire World Youth Parliament for Water. I know that in different regions because we have um, so regional um, a bit of uh, groups, regional groups, and there they also usually conduct surveys, and that's how they approach. And uh, during the the some events, um, especially when you have some specific workshop or seminars organized for young people, there you can also have um, this kind of, uh, for example, vision, how how young people deliver their voices. So. Probably that's it, how we do Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I think this, this answered the um, question, question quite um, broadly. Um, yeah, maybe we try it again um, and try to get uh, Miguel Trejo um, as one of our participants um, on the microphone um, to going, yeah, to ask this question on suggestions, um, how youth, yeah, you can approach um, more senior professionals in a more effective way way. Uh, 
thank you. Can, can you hear me? Okay? okay. Hello, Miguel. Yeah. So yeah, my question was more like mostly focused on uh, how your own organizations and you could approach to senior professionals in order because I think both I was telling something about uh, okay, we as a youth have energy, have like creativity, and we have ideas. But senior professionals, they may have experience, so it would be really nice to, to, to hear from your experience how you can actually approach to senior professionals in order to get their knowledge as well, like in a more horizontal way. Uh, yeah, if I, if I can answer here. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, so the thing is, Central Asian case is um, yeah a bit different probably because we have very uh, vertical approach. Uh, it is not flat absolutely, and that's why we also have this difficulty because usually it is said that young people they don't have enough knowledge, they don't have enough experience, that they don't have actually say, or they don't have enough experience uh, and expertise to 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 bring something really significant which will bring change but how we do that is that we're trying step by step to approach them and probably that's sometimes we can say even annoying them <laughs> by asking question by asking their comments by asking their recommendation a step by step they're trying to to uh, respect us a bit more and to accept us and they uh, when get, when they can see the commitment enthusiasm and they and they, they can really see the potential and they start already themselves involving us and we even have some experiences of um, finding mentors by this by trying to approach to these people and also it works very well as a network you know someone you work with someone and you can you can help another young person to approach this uh, senior specialist with his question and actually so this is, this goes very slowly in Central Asia especially but that actually works and that's difficult process and that definitely needs time but uh, yeah the only thing you can do is if you are really committed just to to keep doing that to keep keep speaking to that people to seniors and um, proving that you actually deserve to to have a say to have a voice that's from my experience thank you for your question may i also uh, add a little bit to that one as well um so thank you i, I love what you said about persistence Bota. um and i also really love what the world youth parliament for water does in mirroring formalized state diplomacy. And that's, that's part of it in looking at how do decision makers present themselves, how do senior professionals present themselves, and mirroring that and using that as a language to gain legitimacy. Also gaining legitimacy by using existing institutions. There might be ways to engage your elected representative that young people don't think about. So for instance, I'm currently based in Canada. You can call your constituency office. Um, you can contact your elected representative and leave them a letter or a message or organize a petition. Um, and sometimes young people completely bypass existing institutions. So this is something to consider um, as a way of engaging. And then also building a groundswell, connecting to your peers, uh, building enough momentum so that people can't look away, um, so that they see that, look, you are organized, you're unified, and you're being consistent about your message, you keep repeating it, as Boda said. No, I just wanted to also quickly, two of the things I wanted to say already, Bota and Natalia spoke about, uh, about being persistent and organizing because it's usually more than one person going and talking about issue when you're organized, you definitely get much more um, attention uh, from, from policymakers. But another um, sort of tactic or strategy that um, I have seen in place, for an example, in my country, um, the conversation on human rights it's even like taboo to talk about human rights but it's okay to sometimes talk about peace so what we do is we use peace educational curriculums and inculcate or infuse human rights education into that when we are doing our workshops um, so also like finding topics that they might be comfortable talking about or working about and then using it as a strategic entry point is one of the uh, things that i can suggest um, and the other thing is um, building relationships with 
young professionals in within those institutions for an example i was referring to the case in um, the the peace negotiations in the philippines for an example those who influenced the peace agreement in the philippines was not even negotiators they were actually the younger staff of the negotiators who were meeting during lunch breaks at the cafeteria who came up with um, innovative language and and then went to their bosses and said why don't you propose this language why don't you propose this alteration and they organized themselves um, so approaching your peers who are based within those organizations would also be another tactic and the other one would really be like getting to know the different tools that are available to you for an example if you're talking about like youth peace and security when the security council adopted this resolution there were 78 countries who came to the security council and endorsed it so for an example your government must have endorsed this or might have endorsed this here in the united nations but they might not necessarily really be um, communicating that or translating in that to in action at the capital level so um, you can also like take these different agreements that your governments have committed to this could be SDGs this could be Paris agreement this could be these different resolutions and like trying to approach them uh, saying that well we know that the government adopted this but let us help you implement this as a partner on the ground and sort of offering them um, offering yourself as a platform as a resource could also uh, be helpful in cases. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for those um, various um, insights and yeah, different different approaches. I think they are all very very helpful. Um, let's maybe go on to the next question, um, which is asked um, by uh, Rose Terhorst. Um, yeah, I, I think she can't um, speak right now, so I'm just going to read it out um, real quick. Um, it's a question. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, it's, so we spoke about the, the role of young people and how young people actually can, can advocate for their own role and contribute to processes and be uh, creative in getting their voice heard. But we also hear of organizations who want to include young people but just don't know how. So even organizations who say, okay, we have it in our strategy, but now we don't know how to operationalize our strategy. So how, what would your advice be to such organizations? Um, yeah, I'll take that one because I work in this uh, huge ancient bureaucracy that is very difficult to change. Um, I think your, your question is very valid and it's on point because um, some of these uh, things that we're talking about even are like new concepts to most of the people who are working for the organization. So in addition to having a policy framework or a guiding framework, we also need to change a lot of attitudes within the organization in order to really believe in this agenda and to uh, for them to be able to be leading this agenda. Now, for an example, when I first went into the sort of the senior management meeting at the UN and when I very openly spoke about the unpaid internships at the UN and how wrong that was and how we need to change that I found like a few people really resisting even having that conversation but now like one and a half years later the UN has appointed an internal committee to review this and hopefully in the very near future um, in actually in a few weeks we will be having a, a solution to that issue so it takes it takes a long time and I think it needs a lot of like attitudinal change and uh, cultural change within the organization as well to support young people and recognize young people's agency and leadership. And on the other hand, um, the lack of accountability within the organizations is also uh, becomes an issue on, on these things because um, if no, if a certain official or a certain professional is um, not being inclusive in the way they work. There's no way for us to also sort of hold them accountable. And, and that is one of the issues that are there in many of the um, sort of intergovernmental agreements that we have now, because even those certain, actually many of them recognize young people as equal partners. Um, there is no proper accountability framework to hold them accountable. So that again becomes another challenge. One of 
the things that we are doing uh, within the organization is for an example last september for the un uh, the secretary general launched a youth strategy and we were very clear when we uh, launched the youth strategy that the strategy is two ways looking so for an example it has an outward looking area where we discuss and give strategic direction to the UN system to work on thematic issues from peace and security, education, health, humanitarian aspects. And then it also has a foundational area looking inwards at the UN, how the United Nations become an innovation pioneer, how we become more accountable, how we walk the talk, um, and how we um, catalyze resources to channel to youth organizations. So um, this is, um, even though the UN has established, like existed for seven five years this is the first time that the un has agreed on a joint framework uh, to address the uh, issues affecting young people and through this um, i'm also um, right now in the processes of planning uh, training programs for un staff who are working on other issues um, for them to look at those issues from a youth angle. So for an example, the leaders of our UN country teams who we call the resident coordinators, the heads of different UN agencies that are based at the country level and regional level, and to brief them, to give them um, uh, also more knowledge, uh, to be able to be more inclusive. Because I think from an organizational point of view, it's very embarrassing when uh, civil society or young people approach the UN and ask you to be inclusive, right? Because we are an organization that um, that is established to do the same. Um, so there are so many challenges as you very correctly uh, identified in your question and we are trying to approach them, but also your support on the ground in holding the UN accountable uh, will be very much appreciated. Uh, can I also add uh, just a short uh, note? Uh, I would suggest, I would advise to that organizations to approach uh, water related networks such as uh, Water Use Network and World Use Parliament for Water because these kind of networks they put together uh, youth from different regions which have expertise and knowledge in different aspects related to water. And that's why I think that related uh, uh, regarding to their topic according to their topic they can they can find young people who can really contribute because it is important not just to have um, any young person but to, to have one who will really significantly contribute to 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 the um, to the substance of the question thank you and um, i would just like to add to both of the two amazing responses um, by adding funding and time um, mentorship is very important to bringing young people on board, as is giving young people the space to either organize themselves or to um, provide funding um, and the space for um, young people to engage in the way that they need to. Uh, so this could be through uh, organizing competitions or um, having more permanent programming available. Uh, for instance, the Wadi Network has been very fortunate to do this research because we've been supported by IHE and the DEPC program. Otherwise, we're a volunteer-run organization. Just wanted to say that. All right. Um, yeah. While you while you mentioned funding, um, we have one more question from the chat. Um, while being aware that we're a little bit over time, but since we started a little bit late, I hope it's all right for everybody if we extend um, a couple more minutes. Um, <laughs> in this case. Um, yeah, Nupur uh, Jain is asking, um, yeah, usually funds become a major obstacle in building networks, capacity building, um, conducting researches, projects, um, and so on. Um, how, in your opinion, can funds be mobilized at local, regional, global level, under water and peace? Um, yeah, which makes it even more supporting for use to assure, assure their participation. Um, yeah, any insights on this one? I'll um, also very quickly respond to that because I might have to run in another five minutes. Um, so um, for an example, I was referring to a progress study on youth peace and security that was done um, to present to the Security Council and what was found in that research was, as, as Natalia mentioned, a majority, actually close to 90% of the youth organizations are informal voluntary and they're run under a $5,000 a year budget. 
Um, so these organizations are therefore like very vulnerable to also like different threats, either coming from the state or different uh, stakeholders or from the environment. Therefore, there is definitely a very big need to invest in building capacities and also institutionalizing and, and helping these organ youth organizations um, come come together. So one of the recommendations made in the progress study is to establish a global fund of 1.8 billion uh, to support youth in, in interventions in peace building. And the number is 1.8 billion to uh, resemble like $1 per one young person. So we have 1.8 billion young people in the world Therefore, if we invest one dollar in one young person, we can we can make this fund happen. But um, I think it's also very important that uh, youth organizations have access to this funding um, because most often when big funders including the United Nations when there is a call for proposals and so on and so forth. They're asking for like registration documents, three years of experience um, and so lots of formalities that sometimes like grassroots um, informal youth organizations might not have. Um, so for an example, before joining the UN, I co-founded a youth organization in my country and we faced so many challenges in um, getting our work started and doing projects in different parts of the country because we were a group of students students who were basically using our pocket money to do this voluntary work. But um, one, one organization called Frida was really our like the starting point because they were giving away um, seed grants to youth organizations um, who have not who does not have a registered formal capacity uh, to get started. So uh, one of my main asks for funders and donors has been to also look at these different models of supporting youth organizations of funding. And I know now, in addition to Frida, like Mama Cash, and there are these different like grants who actually give grants to specifically to youth organizations that are informal and small and, 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 and unregistered. So um, that would be like one of the things that um, I would put in the table. But also, um, I think we are yet to tap into private sector funding. Uh, I'm not an expert on that, but I would really be interested in like learning how young people organize themselves uh, and tap into uh, the private sector investments and funding as well. That was a phenomenal answer. I'm not going to add anything of uh, my own to that. I would just like to reiterate that we have a crowd here um, who has a lot of their own experience and it would be really great if you continue to engage in um, conducting the recommendations paper and drafting that together. We really want to make this as open and inclusive as possible. So again, I'm just going to share the link and uh, please, please, please um, uh, make sure that you're a part of that so we can get in touch with you and continue to build uh, the recommendations together. Uh, just quickly to share experience from my region, from Central Asia. Uh, I would like to say that it's also um, everything what we do is um, on volunteer basis. And the thing is that we're trying to use our network uh, because that's advantage of the network that you can use actually capacity of young people who are located uh, in this area or city where some events or something is happening or for example with this basing youth participation in basing councils so we have some people there young people who we know who are interested who can contribute and they just go there and participate that's one approach and another one is that uh, we were lucky that at the beginning we had this workshop organized uh, funded by SDC but after that, we had we uh, by ourselves organized few events like the one which I shared, uh, organizing Blue Peace Day at UPS. It was um, um, without any financial support, and um, after that, now we we have some support from from um, international development partners who really um, knew about us from from social media or from from another partners probably and who really wanted to support us as young people because they saw our capacity and our commitment and that's why from this perspective we were lucky and now we have uh, we have some financial support for the um, project on developing a capacity of young people from Central Asia from RLC Basin it is a project funded by SDC and implemented by German Kazakh University and the International Secretariat for Water 
So that's that's our story. Okay, amazing. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for um, those very interesting questions as well as answers. Um, I fear we are slowly running actually out of time. Um, yeah, so I really want to thank again um, all our three amazing um, speakers on their presentations and yeah, just showing opportunities to get further involved and in what is what is currently ongoing in the water as well as um, the peace or the United Nations um, sector. Um, yeah, furthermore, thank everybody of the participants for your engagement, um, for your questions, for your interest in the topic. And um, yeah, if you have further questions, just um, connect us directly. Um, I just posted um, all connect, uh, contacts um, in the chat. So just, yeah, whether um, go to the websites or um, write us an email, Twitter, um, whatever. And um, yeah, therefore, um, I really want to thank everybody um, for participation today. Um, any any last words from our speakers? No, just to say how much I enjoyed joining the webinar and hopefully um, I can stay more engaged and uh, really receiving this very direct and concrete feedback and ideas from you, but to also extend you uh, an advance invitation to the Secretary General's Climate Summit that we are all gearing up for, for September and really help us uh, get the message across, but also please come and showcase your initiatives there. We will have more details and more clarity in the, in the weeks and months going ahead and uh, we will be of course sure to share all of that with you thank you also just wanted to say i'm so grateful that there's so much interest um uh, I'm, I'm impressed by both the work of, uh, of my speakers my fellow speakers um and i know there's so much experience uh, on the call as well so an invitation to continue to engage with us um, to work with us on the recommendations paper together. Um, we're stronger when we pool our, our resources. Um, we'll be sharing on what the outcomes are from the diplomacy workshop that we'll be hosting in Egypt in June. Um, and there's also going to be the UNO challenge that I referenced. Um, really, really, really excited to be creating a space to broadcast your ideas um, and solutions. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much also for organizing this webinar. It was first time I used this mechanism and it was really interesting to interact online with all the people to get all the questions and thank you so much. Uh, that was a honor to, to speak here with such an amazing speakers. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much and thank you, Tim. Okay, um, yeah, thanks everybody again. Um, there's nothing left. Um, everybody, I think, have a nice day. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And um, yeah, looking forward to see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Good all. Bye. Bye.